Welcome to worship this second Sunday in Lent. This time, let us begin our worship together, confessing our sin and receiving God's forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. and for all who offer here their work. 
worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Call all of our children together at this time. Today in our gospel reading, we heard Jesus talk about people bearing or carrying a cross. Now we know we don't walk around carrying large wooden crosses on our backs or over our shoulders. 
But did you know that you do carry a cross with you everywhere that you go? You do, because when you were baptized, you were marked with the sign of the cross. Some of you came last week on Ash Wednesday and got a cross marked on your forehead in the shape, uh, a shape of the cross marked on your forehead with ashes. And even though you can't see that cross made of ashes anymore, even though you can't see that cross marked on you at baptism anymore, it is still there reminding you how much God loves you. I invite you right now to turn to someone near you and make the sign of the cross on each other's forehead. A cross shape, remember, goes up and down, left and right. And as you do that, say to one another, you are marked with the cross of Christ. Follow him. You are marked with the cross of Christ. Follow him. I'll let you pause the video now to do that activity together, and then we will pray together. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the sign of the cross to remind us that you love us. Help us to follow you as we carry this sign with us wherever we go. Amen. Today I want us to focus in our time together on one little word, first and foremost. A word that we probably gloss over when we read this gospel passage. It's so easy to get caught up in words like suffering, rejected, Satan, and cross, as important as those words are for us. But we may well gloss over this critically important word right at the beginning of our gospel lesson, teach. Jesus began to teach the disciples about his coming time of suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection. Jesus is speaking words to them, not just as a passion prediction, but as a teaching opportunity. A direct effort to bring about a change in them. He's trying to shape and mold their hearts and their minds so that they can begin to understand more fully the nature of God's kingdom. And that they may begin to understand more than that, the awful ways in which the kingdoms of this world often react to that coming kingdom of God. Now the disciples' minds are not exactly blank slates for this teaching. They've been with Jesus for seven chapters now. During that time, they've seen lots of things and heard lots of things. They've seen him heal many sick people. They've seen him cast out demons and unclean spirits. They've seen him and participated in his feeding of 5,000 people, a second feeding of more than 4,000 people. They've seen him walk on water, and yes, they've seen and heard him teach already in the gospel. His teaching up to this point has been mostly teaching about the coming of God's kingdom and what it will be like, and it's been done mostly through parables. Incidentally, the disciples didn't understand most of those parables either, so it's little wonder they don't really get what he's trying to teach them here either. But here his teaching takes a rather grim turn. No longer is he speaking to them in parables. No longer is he saying things like, the kingdom of God may be compared to a mustard seed. No, now he begins teaching them about the ultimate destination of this ministry they have begun to gather. The ultimate destination we know is the empty tomb. As he says here, on the third day he will be raised. But these other aspects of his teaching, the more somber and sobering ones, cause the disciples fear and even offense here. So much so that they can't begin to imagine what he might mean by that part about being raised on the third day. We have clues from other parts of Mark's gospel right around this teaching that help us understand what the disciples' expectations were prior to Jesus' difficult lesson. Just before this passage, Peter boldly declares Jesus to be the Messiah, which is right and good. Yet right after this passage, 
right after the transfiguration which follows it, Peter and the other disciples begin to argue again about which one of them is the greatest. James and John ask Jesus to give them positions of power in his coming kingdom. They are still expecting Jesus to usher in a new earthly kingdom in which they will be privileged and well off based on their knowing the new king. In our passage today, however, Jesus' teaching is geared toward preparing the disciples for a radically different reality. One marked not by earthly glory, but instead by earthly suffering and rejection. Jesus knows that the powers, religious and political, of his day will not easily cede or share control. After all, already in this gospel, in response to his liberating acts of healing and exorcism, the religious leaders showed more concern about Jesus' unusual methods than his merciful results. They cared more about observing regulations of the law than unleashing the freeing power of that law among all the people of God. For instance, in Mark chapter 2, when Jesus called Levi, the tax collector, and even went to dine in his home with him that evening, Jesus' opponents began to grumble to his other disciples, why does he eat with, teach, with sinners and tax collectors? Jesus and his opponents both weighed the cost of love, forgiveness, and reconciliation on the one hand, and avoiding associating with someone considered unclean on the other hand. Both of these are commands of God. Love and forgive on the one hand, purge the evil from among you on the other. And Jesus chose to reconcile with Levi rather than to recoil from him. His opponents made the opposite calculation. Likewise, in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath and healed a man who had a withered hand, once again, his opponents and he had to weigh the value of healing a person, a good thing, a command of God, and the value of refraining from working on the Sabbath. Again, a good thing and a command of God. Heal on the one hand, keep the Sabbath holy on the other. What would they do? And Jesus chose to heal. His opponents, Mark tells us, not only chose to render the opposite verdict and find fault with what Jesus did, but that very day, we are told, they were carefully watching Jesus to try to catch him in this act of healing on the Sabbath. They had heard he had done that sort of thing before. Their motivation was more on being right, maintaining power and control than on bringing God's goodness and love and healing among the people who needed it most. And Jesus knows it's this same desire for control and power that will cause some of the leaders to have him put to death. He knows it is this same pervasive opposition that will imperil his early disciples as well. That's why he warns them that any who would become his followers may also have a literal cross to bear if they follow through on this whole discipleship journey with him. The same factors that the same factors that led to Jesus' death would not magically clear up after his resurrection. The early church would face the same sort of resistance. They would have the same difficult decisions to make about how they were to participate in God's mission. Peter himself unwittingly becomes a voice speaking in unison with those who opposed Jesus' coming reign. Peter's rebuke of Jesus plays an adversarial, even satanic role, offering Jesus the temptation of a way out of suffering and rejection. Urging Jesus to choose self-preservation over faithfulness to his mission. His rebuke is intended to get Jesus to reevaluate, to weigh again the cost of faithfulness. And to make the opposite decision that would lead not to suffering, 
but to earthly glory. Jesus began to teach the disciples that day what this life would look like. He began to teach them, but he has not yet finished teaching his disciples. Even those of us gathered here and now have more to learn. And do we not need this same lesson? How often in our lives are we forced to weigh one virtue against another? I hear, on the one hand, God's call to care for myself. On the other hand, I hear God's call to care for my neighbor in need. How do I find a balance between the two? Do I choose more to satisfy my own needs and wants? Or do I sacrifice a bit more and give to those who are in need? Or maybe I hear God's call to get along peaceably with others, even those who are crude or cruel or hateful. On the other hand, I hear God's call to speak on behalf of the marginalized and defend those who are lowly. What will I do? Will I speak out and risk hostility, or will I be silent and slump low in shame? Or how about this? I hear God's call to worship and long to worship in the place and time and style of my own heart's desire. On the other hand, I hear God's call to love my neighbor as myself, to place their well-being and honor above my own self-interest. How am I to balance this? Am I to insist on my own way, ignoring the needs and opinions of others, or will I seek instead to listen and show patience and compassion? This is not unlike that strange passage we looked at a few weeks ago from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians about abstaining from eating certain foods. There, remember, Paul said there's no such thing as an idol to sacrifice that food to in the first place, but even knowing that truth, if eating such a food caused a weaker member of the church to stumble, those who were stronger should refrain from eating any such foods, in order to protect and guard those whom they loved. Food is wonderful, right? Freedom to do what you want is wonderful, right? But love of the other takes priority. The Corinthians had to weigh one good thing against another, and Paul urged them to choose sacrificial love over individual liberty. In that case, that day, Jesus began to teach his disciples. He is still teaching his disciples this very day. We are called to follow the way of Jesus, the way of the cross. And that may cost us. We must weigh the cost for ourselves and decide if we can indeed follow him. It's a small wonder that Peter and the others and the people in the crowd that day didn't all go home in disgust and despair. Hopefully Jesus' disciples gathered here this day won't do that either. Remember, remember just after this passage, Jesus took Peter and James and John up on a high mountain and revealed his full glory to them in the transfiguration. Peter. Peter who challenged him and rebuked him here. Peter who would go on not only to argue with all the others about who among them was greatest, but who would also go on to deny Jesus three times in his greatest hour of need. That same Peter, Jesus, still beckoned to him. Follow me. Because regardless of Peter's failures, he was still loved and called by Jesus still urged to follow. And Jesus was faithful to him no matter what. As it is written in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. When we are faithless, 
He remains faithful. Thanks be to God for that. May the seed of his teaching find fertile ground in your heart this day. And may your desire to follow him outweigh your desire to serve yourself or even to save your own life. If in your life you find yourself getting out ahead of Jesus a little bit, this may be an invitation for you to get behind him and follow him. May our witness to his love this week be even half as disruptive to the status quo as his own earthly witness was. In just that way, I urge you to love freely and deeply this week as you follow Jesus. Amen. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. 
teach hum- humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.